Good evening. Welcome to Resia, the research seminar in Islamic arts. Hi. Thank you for coming. You're very numerous and I'm very happy uh, that you're all here. Uh, we have two fantastic guests tonight. Uh, one in France, from France, well, being in two different countries of Europe, one France and one Italy. And um, Dr. Isabel Dolezalek and Dr. Mattia Guidetti. So before I uh, go um, over to them, I welcome them and, and give them the, 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 the uh, floor. I will uh, um, introduce them briefly. So uh, Dr. Isabel Dolezalek's research interests are in the production and reception of medieval art in the Mediterranean cultural interchange and museums. She studied at the Courtauld and Warburg Institutes in London and in Lyon and completed her PhD on Arabic script in Norman Sicily at the Freie Universität in Berlin in 2013, a revised and extended version of which is uh, published, uh, was published in 2017 as Arabic script on Christian kings, textile inscriptions on royal garments from Norma Sicily. Uh, following a four-year project on transcultural connections of objects at the Museum of Islamic Art in Berlin, she joined the Technical University of Berlin to work with Benedict Savoy from 2016 to 2019 researching the translocations of art and cultural property. In 2019, she was appointed uh, junior professor of art history at the University of Greifswald. And current research topics include object biographies and provenance, art and relic theft in the Middle Ages, and the reception of medieval artifacts in the 20th century, 18th to 20th centuries, especially in museums. And Dr. Mattia Guidetti is a senior assistant professor in the history of Islamic art at the University of Bologna. He held research and teaching positions at Harvard University, the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence, the University of Edinburgh, and Vienna University. And in 2017, he published the volume In the Shadow of the Church, uh, the building of mosques in early medieval Syria. And current research projects include the reception of Ottoman artifacts in early modern Italy and Islamic objects in Bologna collections. So it's very, uh, I'm very happy to have you here, Isabella and Mattia. They will uh, talk on interpretations of objects from the Islamic lands during the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, please write your points and questions in the chat uh, for me to pose to the speakers at the end. So Isabel and Mattia, uh, welcome again and over to you. Thank you. Anna for this very generous and kind uh, introduction and for inviting us uh, to Resia uh, to present uh, some of the themes that uh, have um, been addressed by the volume that you are gonna see on the screen now. Uh, which will be the main uh, topic of our talk. So I will start, then uh, Isabel will take over and we'll move uh, back and forward uh, in order to introduce you to the main themes of this book and uh, to try also to underline what is the possible contribution of uh, the main, uh, uh, let's say, theme um, for the field of Islamic art history and more broadly uh, for the field of uh, art history. Um, well, first, uh, let me also thank, um, because we are gonna uh, introduce you to the contents also of the volume, uh, to the other contributors that uh, helped us to make it, uh, I hope, uh, 
a very valid contribution to the field. Uh, so Isabel and I uh, edited the volume, but among the contributors, uh, there are also Anna Contadini, Tobias Mörike, uh, Miriam Thera, and Karin Juven. So I, uh, Isabel and I would like to thank them for uh, what they um, wrote uh, and for the energy they put into this uh, um, project. And of course, the book um, is also uh, published uh, thanks to Routledge. And uh, we would like especially to thank uh, the series editor, Richard Woodfield, um, and also uh, Isabella Vitti and Katie Armstrong from uh, Routledge, and also the production team that helped, especially in the last phase of the publication. So, thank you. Um, so now uh, I would like to introduce you uh, with a few um, words uh, on the uh, general idea uh, that uh, basically gives uh, way to the uh, volume uh, a few years ago. So uh, as many of us know, European elites started collecting uh, objects from Islamic lands uh, in the medieval period. Artifacts were collected uh, in uh, courts and churches treasuries as the result of diplomatic gift exchange, trade, or as uh, spoils of war. And scholars have investigated the changes in the reception of the artifacts throughout the different periods. For instance, uh, Renaissance uh, fascination for some artistic techniques developed in the Islamic world resulted in the acquisition of certain classes of objects such as metalworks and the lusterworks. However, apart from the acquisitions, also the understanding of the objects changed over time. And the research projects that developed eventually into the volume Rediscovering Objects from Islamic Lands in Enlightenment Europe focuses on the understanding of inscriptions displayed on objects from Islamic lands. For a long time, the presence of Arabic inscriptions was not an obstacle to the appreciation of objects from Islamic lands, Arabic inscriptions were left visible, and despite naming Muslim rulers or Islamic religious formula, they were considered inoffensive by Europeans handling the objects. On the one hand, inscriptions were not read and therefore were mute. Very few people knew Oriental languages, and those who knew them did not direct their gaze towards the objects. Uh, on the other hand, it appears Arabic inscriptions for a long time possessed a positive value as they reminded the beholders of the idea of a generic Orient. The Orient included the Holy Land and Arabic inscriptions in some instances were perceived as proof of the presumed provenance of the object from the lands of early Christianity. As some Islamic objects were converted into reliquaries, the alleged provenance of the object from the Holy Land, testified by the inscriptions, was extended to what was contained within the objects, namely the Christian relics. Furthermore, Arabic inscriptions were copied in European artworks. The transfer of inscriptions from Islamic objects to European artworks resulted sometimes in pseudo uh, inscriptions. Though in a few cases, as for instance, in Florence, in the glass window of the Santissima Nunziata, Arabic inscriptions were replicated with accuracy and precision. So we started the project by, with the idea of investigating the moment when Arabic inscriptions started to be read in Europe. Of course, there is not a precise date to start with, but it was rather a process that culminated in the 18th century. The project also aims at determining the cultural circumstances that facilitated the reading of the inscriptions and the implications that the reading of inscriptions had for the objects themselves. 
The reading of inscriptions at the time the objects were reused in a Christian context was of paramount importance. Inscriptions could provide information on the place of provenance and the date of production of the objects, and in turn confirm or deny the stories that circulated about some of the artifacts. I said before that some objects were converted into reliquaries. It should be added that in some cases, objects from Islamic lands were considered Christian relics, inventing for them an anachronistic date of production. And to read inscriptions meant to reveal that such attributions were fictive and therefore to totally change their perception. As an example, I take the object displayed on the cover of the volume, the one you see here. It is the so-called Veil of Saint Anne, here represented in an 18th century drawing. It is a Fatimid textile dated to the final years of the 11th century that arrived in the city of Apt in southern France, probably shortly after the First Crusade. By then, it was presented as a relic of Anne, the mother of Mary, a figure of the early age of Christianity. And in this specific case, the correct reading of the inscription, including the exact date of production, uh, came as the final result of a long process, but eventually disclosed the Fatimid Islamic origins of the textile, denying the attribution of the uh, textile to the early Christian age. But what were the conditions the circumstances that promoted the rediscovery of the Islamic origins of some objects in the Age of Enlightenment. And here we'll mention three of them. So the first aspect to consider was the rise of a new perspective on Islam as a religion and as a civilization. A new understanding of Islam was made possible by the direct reading of the Quran, including its printed edition and its translation into European languages. Recent works of the ERC network, uh, the European Quran, offer plenty of evidence on the increasing engagement of Europeans with the Quranic text in the early modern period. Scholars who studied Islam in Europe in the late 17th and 18th century relied more and more on Arabic Islamic sources, from the commentaries of the Quran to works of history. By the 18th century, Islam started to be considered a religious system of its own and no longer a Christian heresy. The chronology of Muslim dynasties were established and fixed in time, and differences among Muslim thinkers were acknowledged in Europe. So the recent work uh, by Bevilacqua offers a sound survey of the change of perspective on Islam in Europe between the 17th and 18th centuries. The second element has to do with the increasing proficiency in Oriental languages. Between the 17th and 18th century, the knowledge of Oriental languages across Europe increased. Recent volumes as, for instance, the teaching and learning of Arabic in early modern Europe, explain how European institutions and native speaker teachers provided the teaching of languages such as Arabic or Turkish. People from the Levant, mostly Christian Arabs, traveled Europe and were employed as librarians, translators, and professors of Near Eastern languages. They also engaged with objects, though it seems Christian scholars from the Levant sometimes fail to acknowledge some subtleties of historical Arabic texts, including those featured in epigraphical works. The third and final element that we found was the base for the change in the perspective in the reception of Islamic objects in between the late 17th, early 18th century, was the rise of antiquarianism, a cultural approach to history that moved to the foreground the objects. As stated by, among the others, Hernando Mobiliano, 
objects became direct sources of information about the past to the extent that they were preferred to written sources. Coins were very much appreciated among and among the first objects to be studied. Works on Greek and Roman coins were uh, shaped, sorry, the study of coins from the Islamic world. As underlined by the works of uh, Stefan Heidmann and Ariana Dottone, the very first publications dealing with Islamic material culture were numismatic work, such as, for instance, the catalog of the Museo Kufi Conaniano by Simone Assemani. Antiquarianism methodology included the reproduction of the objects or some of their details. Once a precise drawing or etching of an object was made, it either circulated via mail between two private correspondents or was made public through publications. Taken together, all these elements allow to look with new eyes at objects that lie for centuries in European collections, either among other objects within treasuries or resignified in the Christian liturgy. In both cases, they were by then part, integral part of European identity. So now I um, ask Isabel uh, to come in and she will present you uh, the, some more details about the, the, the volume and then she will uh, focus uh, on uh, her case study. Hello everybody, I'll try to share my screen just a second. There we go. In fact, I pick up where Mattia left this, but I added our table of contents. And um, Mattia already said a lot about the um, background to the object rediscovery we were interested in in this volume um, and about the general themes that we tried to address in our book by looking at art or material culture. And I will now speak about the contributions in a little bit more detail. Um, in fact, as you can see, um, we sought to gather case studies covering very diverse European contexts and uh, studies that shed light on the role of objects in Orientalist scholarship in the 18th century, because this is what we sort of identified as a desideratum, as, as something that still needs to be looked at more in depth. Um, as you can see here, we grouped our contributions in three rather loosely defined um, overarching chapters. We have changing perceptions, protagonists and networks, um, and the large question at the end, whose heritage is it that we are looking at here with these objects? And these are chapters that firstly, of course, address the evolution taking place in dealing with objects from Islamic lands um, between the early modern period and the 18th century. Um, the second chapter focuses on individuals and on networks of Orientalist exchange. And the contributions in the last part address broader questions about the implications of the new way of understanding Oriental objects uh, and dealing with them, not least, as we argue, um, in fact, their exclusion from the concept of European heritage at that very moment in time. Um, so you can see the table of contents with contributions written by Mattia and myself, and um, with a large introductory overview by Anna Contadini, who adopts a very broad chronological and contextual frame to, um, to raise the question of the specificity of the 18th century approach in comparison to what uh, happened previously or how people engaged with the Oriental um, previously in previous centuries. Um, Tobias Mörike, Mattia said that, uh, already mentioned that, already focused on um, Maronite Christians as object interpreters in early modern Europe. And um, 
these Maronite Arab Christians, so native speakers in Europe were actually very numerous, but have been quite overlooked so far with some exceptions um, in scholarship to date. Karim Juvin, on the other hand, focused on one of the iconic objects um, that had to come into our volume, I guess, the Baptistère de Saint-Louis, which many of you will know, it's kept in the Louvre uh, today. And she discussed the discursive reappropriation of this object once its origins were revealed, once the object was read in the 18th century, this uh, metal basin from the Near East was kind of turned into a, a national monument. It was used for national nationalist French um, discourse. And um, our last contribution by Miriam Serabrea then turns to Spain, uh, which is also obviously an, a really important place <laughs> for our topic with a case study on the Mesquita Catedral of Cordoba. And uh, she discusses its split reception between um, Arab heritage in the construction of a national Spanish history and initiatives which resulted in very uh, thorough studies of the Arab legacy of Al-Andalus. So how is the Mesquita Catedral received um, and how is the Arabic heritage actually used in constructions of Spanish identity? What all contributions have in common is that they shed light on processes of decipherment and recognition of monuments and objects with transcultural biographies. They speak about the rediscovery of provenances and they address the ensuing classification of objects. And in doing so, they also raise the question to what extent the long 18th century um, can also be considered a period in which Islamic objects uh, began to be excluded from European culture. So the 18th century is a very fundamental moment um, in the creation of national identities or senses of national, cultural, local identities. Um, so what, what is the role played by these rediscoveries of Oriental objects at that spe specific time? Of course, I am not in a, good position to speak in much depth about anyone else's research. So um, I hope you will be able to read the book. But what I am going to do and what Matthias is going to do afterwards is to present some aspects of my own case study on um, an Orientalist from Northern Germany. Um, and um, we will try to open up our own case studies to broader questions addressed in the volume. So we can discuss that afterwards. But I'll start with my protagonist and I can't, yeah, that's working now. Olof Gerhard Tuchsen um, was born in 1734 in what is now Denmark, but he spent much of I mean, most of his life in northern Germany, he studied in Halle, theology and um, oriental literature, and he was appointed professor for oriental languages in Mecklenburg, which is in northeastern Germany, uh, in the 1760s, first at the University of Bützel, which no longer exists, and then he moved to Rostock, where he actually spent the rest of his life until he died in 1815. And there are several good reasons, I guess, why I focused on this particular Orientalist protagonist. Firstly, he um, had a reputation of being an excellent paleographer and Mattia already pointed at the importance of reading inscriptions in the rediscovery of objects. Um, so Tichsen, as a great paleographer was consulted by collectors and scholars all over Europe for reading object inscriptions, um, particularly on coins as well. And uh, so he had a huge network and actually gained a lot of fame for what he was doing. And then his work, which is a, a second important point why I chose to focus on Tuchsen, uh, his work is extremely well and accessibly documented 
In fact, the Library of Rostock University keeps his nachlass, his um, estate, which includes a huge number of unpublished documents and 12 massive folders of correspondence with Orientalists from all over the world or the European world. And, um, and all of that is currently being digitized, which was quite significant in um, times of pandemic research to be able to actually access something while doing research on it. So this is, this is Olaf Gerhard Tüchsen. And um, thanks to this documentation, I was able to trace the process of rediscovery of several important objects in Tüchsen's correspondence which um, actually reveals through networks for discussing objects. And I was also able to catch a glimpse of Tüchsen's working methods, which appear as the precursors of um, art historical methods established further on in the 19th century. So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I would like to show what I mean um, by these discoveries using the example of the throne of St. Peter, which you can see here on the right on my slide in the church of San Pietro di Castello in Venice. Um, and according to local tradition, this chair had belonged to the apostle Peter in Antioch and it had allegedly been given to Venice in the ninth century by the Byzantine emperor. Um, Tüchsen published an interpretation of this seat in 1787 and then again in the following year and in 1794 in slightly revised form. So this is an object that uh, occupied him for a long time. And we know that this was a publication which circulated widely in both Protestant and Catholic Europe and that it actually caused a real stir. <laughs> And um, why? Because Tüchsen had looked closely at the inscriptions on the backrest, which you can see. I'm, I'm not sure you can see my cursor, but it's, yeah, all right, right there in the frieze. Um, so he looked at the inscriptions and discovered that there were excerpts from the Quran, which is quite unusual or strange for something that is said to have belonged to the apostle Peter. So, um, so this is what we mean when Mattia and I in the volume speak about the demystification of objects in the 18th century. Um, suddenly a Christian object that was venerated as the throne of St. Peter for centuries um, is stripped of its attribution and turned into an Islamic object with a totally different biography and, um, and provenance, of course. So, I said um, in the introduction that one could catch a glimpse of Tüchsen's working methods. And in fact, in my work with the archival uh, documents, I found some notes, very interesting notes that allow us to trace how Tüchsen um, actually brought to light or uncovered what he says were horrible lies about this object. And it all revolves, oh, where's the next slide? Um, it is all based on what you can see here in the second image from the left. Um, this is folio 37 recto of a folder called Alpha Beta Orientalia from Tüchsen's estate. And what you can see here is actually Tüchsen deciphering the alphabetum cuficum, the cufic alphabet on this cathedra of marble found in the church of St. Peter in Castello. And um, what he does is um, to very, well, First of all, I guess he wrote the Arabic alphabet in the left-hand margin. You can see Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, and, and so forth. And then he systematically searched the inscription on the chair for letter shapes at the beginning and at the end of the word and in the middle of the word. So he, he made his own list to decipher this Kufic inscription. And you can actually follow his process of working on the inscription 
very well in his notes, I think. And we know exactly what he was working from. He never actually left Rostock. He was working from an image and he says which one. Um, this is actually taken from Flaminio Cornaro's uh, publication about Venetian monuments. And this is what he was working with. So a reproduction of the inscription. The result of all of this was the publication. I already mentioned an engraving, first of all, that Tuchsen made himself with a long, accurate reproduction of the inscription, which he also transcribes. And I find very interesting, especially in this uh, document from Tuchsen's archives and from his publication, how much emphasis he puts on the in, on the inscription rather than on the object. You see the object is totally marginalized. What really interests him is the inscription. And uh, on the right, you can see the, the publication in its uh, first form. So the object interpretation in this case relies on Tuchsen's paleographic expertise and on the circulation of accurate images. He never saw the object in person. But the demystification of this former throne of St. Peter significantly gains in complexity once first-hand study um, comes into play. And this first-hand study is traceable in Tuchsen's correspondence with Simone Asemani, a scholar from Padua, Mattia already mentioned, who actually went to the church in Venice and looked at the, the object and discussed his findings um, with Tuchsen. And he tried to convince Tuchsen that this was not actually a chair, but an Islamic tombstone and several other um, marble and, sandstone and um, limestone slabs that had been assembled later. Um, so in this discussion, which, which Tuchsen later published as an appendix to his reprint of the Interpretatio, we see a progressive engagement with the material components of the objects, of the object, its exact measurements and the context in which it was made and used. And that is a process rooted in antiquarian practices of the past, but it is also one which heralds the emergence of Islamic artistry as a discipline in the following century. Beside my interest for Tuchsen's working methods, I was also um, very fascinated by Tuchsen's errors, his misreadings and misinterpretations that, as I found, often appear to um, conform very much to, to stereotypical expectations and bias. And in the case of this chair, for instance, Tuchsen really stubbornly holds on to his belief that this is a throne, this is a chair given to the Church of Venice, rather than accepting, um, accepting the point of view um, that derives from the first of first-hand study of the object. So he, he really wants to believe what he thinks he already knows about the object. And perhaps a, an even more spectacular example of misinterpretation from today's point of view is that of Tichson's decipherment of the mantle of Roger II, or the coronation mantle of the Holy Roman Empire. And this, um, as you might know, has been attributed to Charlemagne, so to the ninth century emperor. Um, but Tuchsen read it in its inscription and correctly identified its manufacture in 12th century Sicily, so in Norman Christian Sicily. Um, although the wording of Tuchsen's translation of the inscription, which you can see here on the slide, was relatively neutral. Um, so it's basically what we read now. It's the dating and location of the production of the mantle. Um, his interpretation of how the mantle arrived in the realm of Latin Christian Europe is um, heavily biased and quite revealing in terms of the influence of bias on object interpretation, I think. So what he says, I translated this down here, is, um, this mantle was produced by subjugated Arabs in Sicily for their conqueror, King Roger, in the year 1133 as a sign of their subservience. 
Um, and I think that's highly revealing because how come there's nothing in the inscription that says this is a tribute by subservient Muslims? Um, how come he considers this a tribute to a Christian um, conqueror? And several reasons for that that uh, he argues for, um, which I won't mention because of time restrictions, but you can ask me later. I suggest that the reasons behind this interpretation lie in the field of uh, bias. He clearly, Tuchson clearly perceives the object as transgressive. Its Arabic inscriptions are an intrusion into Latin, Latin Christian contexts, which uh, he thinks he ought to explain by this, um, well, by arguing this must have been a tribute. Um, and to some extent, this is still the case today. Islamicate objects had permeated European cultures for centuries. It is quite ironic then that the very quest to learn about them, the effort to decipher, entailed their extraction from the construction of a European heritage. And we can discuss this further at the end, but um, Mattia is going to show you another case study um, before that. Thank you, Isabel. I'm going to share my screen again. Yeah. Well, um, my case study in the volume, and so what I'm going to present you briefly today is slightly different because it deals with uh, some objects that uh, were new in Europe and were interpreted as Islamic objects as soon as they reached Europe uh, in the late 17th and then in the 18th century. In fact, I deal with uh, um, the reception of Ottoman banners, some of which you can see here in this slide, uh, in the state of the church during the years following the siege of Vienna of 1683. My contribution focuses therefore not on objects that by the 17th, 18th centuries were already in Europe, but rather with objects that were newcomers, just arrived in Europe. The interest of these objects for the project of the rediscovering, so for the volume, lies in the fact that the spoils of war, such as banners, were carefully scrutinized as soon as they reached Catholic territories. Several Ottoman banners were installed within churches and sanctuaries. They were considered ex voto and celebrated as signs of the triumph over the enemy and signs of the efficiency of the religious figures that were asked to help the Christian army during the battles against the Ottomans. Some of these banners presented highly visible inscriptional programs like those you see here in the screen. That attracted a lot of attention as soon as they reached uh, Europe and in this case, Italy or central Italy. In some cases, the study of the inscriptions joined to the scrutiny of other details of the flag were included in publications. But these publications present the trophy from all, from various angles. So they discuss its, their material, the dimensions, their iconography, and their inscriptions. And I would like to briefly present you the case of two large Ottoman banners donated by the Polish King John III Sobieski to Pope Innocent XI in Rome. One conquered in Vienna was expected to remain in Rome, displayed in St. Peter Basilica, and now he's lost, 
while the other one conquered at Parkani, uh, today in Hungary, was to be sent to the Marian sanctuary of Loreto, and today is in Krakow in Poland. As soon as they arrived in Rome, they both became the subject of a series of publications. As investigated by Barbara Karl, the publications devoted to Ottoman banners range from single leaflets, single folio, to booklets of around 10 pages. Together with other express publications, they circulated across Europe, spreading the news about recent events, especially regarding war theaters. As they reach a different strata of the society, these publications also serve as propaganda aims. Regarding the one that ended up in the uh, sanctuary of Loreto, there are three different. There were three different publications produced on this banner, and all three publications share a core of information that includes technical data about the banner, so the size, the material, the circumstances of the capture and the donation up to the sanctuary, and an explanation of some aspects of its iconography and the translation of its inscriptions. On top of this, one pamphlet, so the longest among the three publications, adds an introduction devoted to the tradition of donating trophies of war to religious sanctuaries. According to the pamphlet, Loreto was but the most recent example of a tradition dating back to the time of antiquity, as testified by a passage of the Aeneid, which is added to the text. This pamphlet also deepens the religious interpretation of some iconographic elements visible on the banner. It is the case, for instance, of the double-bladed sword called Zulfikar in the Islamic tradition, which is explained in the pamphlet as a symbol of the Ottoman dominion on the East and on the West. The pamphlet also reports that in the Catholic world, someone interpreted the double-bladed sword at the light of a passage of the Book of the Revelation, according to which the last ruler announcing the end of time would have a sword emanating from his mouth. So, though inaccurate, there was therefore an effort to offer an explanation of the iconography visible on the banners. At the same time, all publications stress the meaning of the inscriptions for which a translation is offered. The available documentation in the Vatican Library in Rome allows uncovering the process that led to the interpretation of the inscriptions on both the banner sent to St. Peter and the one sent to the Holy House of Loreto. Both of them were sent to Rome to Cardinal Barberini in his role of protector of the Kingdom of Poland. I mentioned before that the donor of both banners was the King of Poland. So in the year 1683, when the first banner arrived to Rome, Cardinal Barberini summoned Banesio de Maronite, a reader of Arabic and Syriac language at the Collegio Urbano de Propaganda Fide in Rome and a priest native of Damascus in Syria that was resident in Rome. The two Christian Arabs interpreted the inscriptions visible in the banner. A few days later, however, Ludovico Maracci, the famous Orientalist, who by then was working on the edition, translation and commentary of the Quran, eventually published in Padua in the year 1698, submitted a better reading and translation of the inscriptions that were included in the publication. In the case of the second banner, the one sent to Rome one year later and eventually displayed in Loreto, Cardinal Barberini only informs that he ordered the letters inscribed in the banner to be interpreted and translated, though we are unsure about who was involved 
into the process. So the necessity, however, to make public the content of the inscription of a trophy of war was not a new one. In 1571, a final, which is the silver element topping the pole of a flag, conquered in the Battle of Lepanto, ended up in Venice. It was then reproduced in an engraving and included in several publications, among which the one you see here on the screen dated to 1575. Its lettere turkesque, Turkish letters, were translated, though with some mistakes, making it one of the earliest Islamic objects to be interpreted in Europe. Palmyra Johnson Brummett stressed the importance to publish the details of a trophy of war. According to her, the final became an object of study through which it was possible to reveal precise details of the religious practice of the Turks by using their own words. Shen Nelson, more recently, working on similar trophies of war that reached the city of Florence, underlines how the deciphering of the inscriptions meant to decrypt a message potentially dangerous. If before such direct military confrontation, the perception of the Arabic language was disconnected from its contents, as I mentioned in the introduction, the appearance of Arabic letters on military paraphernalia taken from the enemies transformed the language and the inscriptions into a direct emanation from the enemy. And to interpret their inscriptions meant to make sense of them and eventually take full control of their content. However, in Venice in 1571, the information on the objects were very limited and the translation inaccurate. The 1683 and 1684 publications produced to celebrate the arrival of the two large Ottoman banners from Vienna and Parcani explored the objects from all possible angles. They included the reproduction of the flag and a series of technical data such as the size, the material, its formal description, and finally they add a full translation of the inscriptions and a tentative interpretation of the iconography displayed on the flags. The publications concerning the Ottoman banners that reached Rome go beyond the mere translation of inscriptions to offer a tentative explanation of all aspects of the objects. Though these studies did not have yet any art historical focus, they were made possible by the interplay between antiquarianism and orientalism described in the introduction and path the way for later publications on other objects from the Islamic world. And during the age of enlightenment, the growing awareness that the Islamic world had a material and visual culture of its own and the presence of persons provided with the skills to read the inscription led to rethink objects that until then were not investigated as Isabel shown with the mantle of Roger II or the chair of St. Peter in Venice. Given specific historical circumstances, in Spain it was possible quite early to assemble the remains of Islamic antiquity under one single umbrella. The term Arab started to be used as a collective designation for what was produced during the Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula. Elsewhere, instead, there was not yet a collective definition for labeling the provenance of the objects. The division between Arab, Turkish, and Persian material culture would become familiar only in the 19th century. So later, as for instance, with the work uh, Monument Arabe Persan et Turc du cabinet de Monsieur Le Duc de Blacas et d'autres cabinets published in Paris in 1828 
by Renault. However, a fundamental step in the recognition that specific objects originated from Islamic lands took place in the late 17th and during the 18th century through the interpretation of their inscriptions. The scrutiny of the objects allowed scholars to know them better, but it had at the same time far reaching implications for the way they were perceived in Europe. And so now perhaps Isabel will uh, say a final word on this uh, change of perception, what it meant for the objects afterwards. Yes, uh, don't worry, I'll keep it very brief. Um, but one point I would like to um, make again here at the end is that we talked, of course, in the case studies, we talked about object rediscoveries in terms of what seems like a very, uh, like a narrative of a very enlightened uh, progress. So objects are freed from false beliefs and reattributed to their real origins. So. Um, it seems like a progress, like a progression. This, um, however, is only part of the story, of course, the fixation on origins, which arguably still prevails in art history, was a component of the teleology of enlightenment, which may of course be uh, questioned as well. Orientalist studies gave Islamic hate material culture an anchoring in a modern European geography of knowledge centered on questions of patronage, techniques, um, artist style and iconography. And we all know very well that in recent years, research has increasingly moved away from uh, this strict focus on origins to scrutinize also trajectories of objects and uh, object biographies. Um, so the functions and meanings they assumed at different stages of their lives. But in the volume, uh, we tried to single out this very moment in which the focus on origins came, came to the fore. And uh, we tried to analyze what it actually meant for the study of objects within the emerging historical disciplines. And this moment lastly also appears highly significant uh, for another reason, which we alluded to already, uh, which is that the Orientalist claim laid on objects. Uh, so this object appropriation by the Ori Orientalist scholar scholars meant um, conceptually extracting these objects from a local heritage. And uh, this at a time when local and national European identities and ideas of cultural heritage were forged. So regarding material culture, we argue um, that this is one of the moments in which Oriental and Western were taken apart and opposed. And I'll, uh, I'll stop at this. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Isabel and Mattia, for this very interesting um, a comprehensive dis discussion of the subject, especially for highlighting how interpretations are multiple and complex and produce a, you know, a multicolored picture <laughs> that needs to be further studied, as, as you said. And also thank you for your clarity of exposition. Very well done. Um, while I'm uh, uh, waiting for questions and comments, I see there is already something in the chat, but while we're waiting for more, um, may I ask a couple of questions to you? So to Isabel, I, um, you know, you talked about the mystification when talking about the cat Cathedral of St. Peter in Venice and, and that he, it caused a stir when, you know, fixed and discovered that those were um, Quranic uh, um, uh, phrases. So <clears throat> I wonder whether you can say something about what, what, what the consequences then were of this demystification, um, not just on the scholarly community, but maybe on the church authorities, on other communities.
Yeah, thank you very much. I um, Obviously, I focused more on the Orientalist community, and I know that um, this demystification caused quite a stir because um, also of correspondence of Tuchsen's letters in, um, in which he mentioned how fiercely this is judged or criticized by the Catholics. I haven't yet um, gone into further um, research about the reception actually of Tuchsen's work locally in Venice, which would be the next step to take. Um, yeah, so I, I can, yeah. The cathedral is still there. Yes, it is. It hasn't been removed. <laughs> no, it hasn't been removed. Um, it's still there and it's it's in the southern aisle of the church. I actually thought it was in the apse. It is not. It's, it's mm. not that um, prominently positioned. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's as I said, it's the next step. I will try to investigate how how this was actually received locally in the church, if it changed something in the litur in the liturgical use of this chair or not. Um, Thank you to very be much. Seen. Thank you, and very briefly to Mattia. Uh, um, if I if I may add something uh, on, on this, um, <laughs> uh, well, of course, it would be very interesting to know how ch local church authorities reacted uh, about. Uh, uh, let's say this new reading of the object as not being the relic of St. Peter, but an Islamic uh, tombstone and an object assembled much later. And, um, and, and perhaps, who knows, future work will uh, um, unveil this aspect. But uh, I think what is uh, very relevant on, on, on this uh, moment, and uh, Isabel mentioned it uh, um, with regard to the uh, cathedra in the correspondence between uh, uh, Assemani and Tixen, but it also happens in the case of the Vale of St. Anne, um, is a sort of effort uh, to, yes, decipher the inscription, but still negotiate the new meaning with the old interpretation of the object. So, for instance, there is a, uh, for a few decades, the Vale of St. Anne, I mean, the inscription on the Vale of St. Anne, which is Arabic, of course, was interpreted as Coptic because Coptic gave the possibility to, uh, yes, I mean, it is an Oriental language, it can be read, uh, but still it's connected with Christian antiquity, and so with Christ later uh, antique Egypt, and so perhaps the relic can remain a sort of authentic relic. Mm -hmm. uh, while basically accepting that that was Arabic uh, and the date was 11th century, made uh, the identification of the textile uh, with Anne, the mother of Mary, completely uh, impossible. So, um, um, sure, there is more to do, but uh, there is also this uh, first, let's say, uh, effort to uh, negotiate the two, uh, no, the old tradition and the, and the new readings. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mattia. Um, I, just a quick question to you. Um, when talking about the publications of the banners, their inscriptions, and then they were sent to Rome, and this was to aim spreading, highlighting the European victories against the Ottomans, uh, but they also contributed to a new approach towards Islamic objects, you said. Um, so at what point do, do they then become objects of scientific inquiries? Is it with the Enlightenment or is it a process? And, and are the two phenomena, you know, the trophy and the study of the objects, uh, do they run in parallel? So I think they run in parallel. Um... So on the one hand, these publications were useful in order to um, uh, make people know that these objects were conquered and donated to specific uh, uh, churches by specific patrons, of course, um, through other specific persons in Rome. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, in producing uh, an accurate uh, description of these uh, objects, uh, they became an object of study. 
and, and the publications reveal the accuracy of the observations on the flag. I mean, of course, there are some uh, uh, mistakes, some inaccuracy, like for instance, uh, the, the silk, which is the material, the main material of the large banner in Loreto, was interpreted as uh, pelo di camello, so uh, camel uh, hairs. Um, so of course there were uh, some mistakes, not for the inscriptions, the inscriptions were very well understood and very well interpreted. And so uh, in, in, in the same moment they arrived and they became an ex voto, they also became an object of study. And, and so it's an interesting, uh, of course, uh, there were other reasons than uh, academic reasons, so to speak, or scientific reasons for investigating this object. But the final result was the production of a work that includes really, it's, it looks like a catalog, uh, an entry of modern catalog. Um, so with all the information that you need to know about this object. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, we have some uh, questions and comments in the chat. Victoria, and you, uh, can I ask please why, when there were centers of extraordinary excellence in translation in the Arab world and in Europe, contemporaneous to the 11th, 14th century, especially in very early medical and philosophical works from the Greek and Arab worlds through which European scholars and humanists were able to read and understand these great works in Latin and some of whom would have been attached to important courts or churches, there seems to be uh, such a gap of centuries until there is the ability to read and understand these Arabic inscriptions on objects entering the major European collections of the medieval period or to realize they were of importance. Um, perhaps if I may, I think one good example to this really intriguing question um, would be to mention again the coronation regalia of the Holy Roman Empire because um, one wonders, these objects, the mantle uh, was used for centuries in coronation ceremonies. Why did nobody notice um, the Arabic inscription? And they, we, we actually know they didn't notice them because of, amongst others, um, written records about the disputes during the time of the Reformation between Nuremberg, the Protestant uh, city, which was the keeper of the of the regalia and uh, Catholics who were trying to dispute the, the um, possession of the of the regalia uh, to the city of Nuremberg and in these there are um, arguments being exchanged which all center about the attribution of the objects Arabic inscribed objects mantles stockings and so on um, to Charlemagne and um, that this would have been a moment in which looking at an Arabic inscription and noticing it and saying, oh, well, this was made in Sicily in the 12th century, century would have greatly helped arguing against an attribution of the objects to Charlemagne, an emperor of the ninth uh, century who was canonized and um, and therefore these objects were considered as relics. Um, so this would have helped them. It would have helped them to notice the Arabic inscription, but they didn't see it. They just simply did not see it. And in the, in the pamphlets from the 1620s, uh, where Nuremberg tries to argue why the mantle of Roger II cannot be a relic of Charlemagne, nobody mentions the inscription, nobody sees it. And that is also the case in the early 18th century with reproductions of these objects. Um, the mantle's uh, inscription has been read at the time the reproductions were, had been read when the reproductions were made, but um, other inscriptions hadn't been read and these were not reproduced, nobody saw them while looking carefully at the objects to make reproduction. So it's a, it's a very strange case of um, you can only see what you expect and uh, what you know, and you can't see the, the, the rest. 
Thank you. Uh, Mattia, do you want to? Yeah, add yeah. It, it, it is a, a, a great question, of course. And I, and I think a possible answer is that um, it was not enough to know uh, uh, the Oriental languages or to know uh, Arabic uh, in order to have uh, the mental, so to speak, uh, um, uh, inclination to look at these objects. As I mentioned in the introduction, it is the sum of different, let's say, conditions or circumstances that uh, took place in the Age of Enlightenment that allow to look with new eyes at old objects. Uh, so, of course, you need to know languages, you need to have this paleographic uh, uh, kind of uh, expertise, uh, exceptional in the case of Tixen. Uh, you need to have more uh, people who know Arabic that go around and look at uh, things. But at the same time, for instance, the fact that objects started to be considered a possible source for historical inquiry took place only in the late 17th, 18th century. So this is the moment in which, for instance, coins started to... to, to, to to be uh, a sort of, were considered a more reliable source for writing history than uh, other written sources. Because there was not any mediation in between. Uh, uh, no, it, it was not someone speaking of, no, later of uh, early Roman emperors, but the Roman emperors themselves coining the coins, minting the coins, uh, giving us the information about themselves. And, and I think, this new idea uh, help, helped in, uh, uh, let's say, making objects more attractive also to scholars. Um, and this took place only in the, in the 18th century. I mean, before that, objects were very important. I mean, uh, Anna Contadini uh, is working and worked a lot on the Renaissance uh, perception and admiration of Islamic objects because they were central but for other reasons but to take objects as a possible source of information and therefore to look at the inscriptions it meant another vision of uh, objects themselves and the the way uh, history was written thank you very much um <clears throat> So please write your comments in the chat. Uh, we have uh, Karen Pinto says terrific work. Sofia Vasilopoulou, how great new results revealing the gap between medieval early modern and uh, 18th century regarding the contextualization uh, of objects. Thank you so much for this work. Um, Simon O'Meara, thank you very much for your talk and above all for this extremely timely book my internet connection is poor tonight, so I apologize if I missed it, but could you tell us about the cover image for the latter, which I, for one, find most intriguing? So the, the cover of the book. Sorry, yes. As I said, uh, the, the cover of the book, uh, um, I mean, um, involves uh, Tixen, by the way, uh, because basically is the uh, one of the drawings of the Vale of Saint Anne um, sent to Tixen for an interpretation uh, in the 18th century. Uh, however, when this drawing was done, uh, there was not uh, a full knowledge that this detail uh, came from the textile that was in St. Anne. So the story is very complicated. Uh, a final uh, uh, interpretation came uh, out only in the 19th century, accepted by everyone. And basically, there were two different lines of inquiry on these objects. Uh, one uh, through the drawing. Uh, Maria Vittoria Fontana wrote an article on, on, on uh, this aspect. And another one by looking at the object in uh, uh, Apt in southern France. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a detail. Um, it's a detail, by the way, um, very interesting also because that uh, part of the textile um, is, uh, was ruined afterwards, so it was uh, half lost. So we still have uh, an image of how it looked like before it was ruined. So yeah, it's important like for this reason. Mm. 
I think it's quite interesting relating to Simon's observation that there is a sort of, um, you know, the, the drawings on, or the, the, the figures on the drawing that they are trying to, it's, they try to modernize the past because they're not obviously exact drawings. So there is sort of this idea of reproducing it in a way that can be, that is part of the visual sort of culture of the time, yes? Yes, and how not to mention in this regard the Baptistère and the early, uh, the earliest depiction of the Baptistère that focus very much on the figurative uh, friezes of the Baptistère um, but not fully convincing, let's say, in replicating the uh, Mamluk style of the Baptistère, uh, looking instead more uh, um, uh, Renaissance-like uh, figures. And the same uh, can be said about uh, an object uh, that is in Bologna, for instance, uh, which is the uh, Cospi Ewer that was reproduced in a catalog uh, in the 17th century, and the reproduction of this ewer uh, misses, for instance, the inscription, which is a very interesting. I mean, the inscription was there, was very visible, but was not replicated in the drawing. And uh, the figures on the ewer are basically given a sort of early modern Italian uh, um, looking, uh, which is also uh, interesting. Uh, don't worry, Isabel, we are fine. <laughs> <laughs> Isabel says, please excuse me, I have a very desperate baby. She has a four month old baby. Uh, there is another uh, question or um, point from Klaus Peter Hase. Thank you very much for new lights on the intriguing functions and studies of fine uh, foreign objects in European collections. A main issue remains the high evaluation of their aesthetic qualities, the recognition of their value. Yes, indeed. Um, um, and, and perhaps uh, this is a very, very important point because the, um, the priority, so to speak, taken by uh, paleographers and uh, early orientalists, uh, I mean, with orientalists here, I mean uh, people who uh, master the oriental languages, um, uh, perhaps uh, move to the foreground uh, the aesthetic appreciation of the objects. I mean, they were really interested in the details of the inscription, in the, in the contents of the inscription, and perhaps less interested in the uh, technique and the technical aspects and, and in the aesthetic qualities. Uh, though we know that they, um, they were very much appreciated. I mean, they were before and they, uh, they kept being so uh, into the 19th century. Thank you. Um, Valerie Gonzalez, thank you very much for this very informative talk. The so-called Seal of Solomon appears frequently in this material, sometimes very prominently. Did you find any interpretation of this pattern in this period sources? Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, it, it's, it's true also on the flex you have uh, the Solomon uh, seal. And well, what I can, there is not an interpretation really, but is identified as such already in the late uh, 17th century. So if you read these uh, pamphlets that are published on the Ottoman banners in the description of the iconography, um, there is the Zulfika, of course, which is very visible and uh, very difficult to interpret. In fact, they, they did mistakes in this interpretation. Uh, there were uh, medallions. Uh, and, uh, and other stuff, but uh, there, the, also the Solomon seal is mentioned, though, I mean, no interpretation is really offered. Um, uh, for instance, uh, one interpretation which is uh, interesting is that uh, uh, one of the, there are four medallions which look one, uh, one um, look uh, like the other ones, and uh, these are interpreted as the, um, let's say, um, uh, what is left by the horse of Muhammad during the night journey, the sort of symbol. So there, there are a lot of uh, sort of uh, 
um, stretching the evidence uh, and a sort of misinterpretation of the iconography. Uh, whereas for the uh, inscriptions, they were very strict and very reliable. For the interpretation of the iconography, there was more freedom to invent uh, meanings. Um, and the Solomon seal is described as a Solomon seal, and that's it. I mean, no, no interpretation is given. Thank you. And Miriam, yes, I, I did ra uh, read the, the first question by Toria. Um, is there any other question? Oh, and, uh, so Philip Zobel says, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, if I got it right, Mr. Guidetti talked about a church window that displays Arabic inscriptions. Was this a singular case and was it uh, a pseudoscript or legible, especially in light of the reproduction shown, uh, the Turkish finial, where the Arabic letters were interestingly given? This would seem very interesting. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, um, the one I mentioned is dated, well, first of all, is in the Church of the Santissima Annunziata in Florence. It's a, uh, it's a glass window. Um, we know uh, at least two, two cases of glass windows with uh, Arabic letterings. Uh, one is in Milan, but it's a pseudo inscription, apparently. And one is in Florence, in the Santissima Annunziata, and uh, is not a pseudo inscription uh, in the sense that uh, it is legible and uh, it has to do with contemporary uh, Mamluk motto uh, of the uh, Mamluk Sultan of Egypt. And the one in Florence was produced in the second half of the 15th century, so more or less 1460s, which you're right. Uh, it's very interesting at the light of later um, interpretation of uh, the text of the final uh, uh, in Venice, in the sense that it's a very early uh, transposition, uh, 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 transference of the of the inscription Arabic inscription into an European uh, um, artwork. Um, it's interesting, but it deals with another aspect, I think. Think I guess, which is uh, the um, diffusion of um, Islamic uh, artistic aspects into European art. I mean, what we are dealing with uh, uh, in uh, most part of the volume is to deal with the documentation of objects, right? Whereas in the case of the window, we would have a sort of European artwork replicating uh, an Islamic uh, artwork, which is which uh, pertains to another domain. Though I agree with you that um, uh, to have a exact and precise, accurate replica of an Islamic inscription into an European artwork suggests that uh, someone there was able to make sense of it. Huh? Uh, so um, yes, and that starts perhaps even earlier if we want to consider the Renaissance uh, 15th century. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are some, uh, thank you. Thanks for sharing your work in this interesting presentation, Miriam. Alison, thank you for this fascinating work. Any further points or questions? Otherwise we just uh, say, thank you so much, Mattia and Isabel. And um, it was a really interesting. And is Isabel coming back? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, a virtual applause. And uh, see you soon. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Isabel. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.